honor you, God. Thank you, Lord, that today has a purpose. A God-given, glorious purpose. Lord, I just ask that you would just come in, Father God, to wherever we are right now, Lord, and just fill the space with your presence. Lord, that you just fill the space with your presence today, because in your presence there is freedom. In your presence there is peace. Lord, I ask that you would just speak to our hearts today, God.
tell you which songs to sing but this last from the goodness of God <laughs> I've been listening to that all week because I've been serving the Lord now over 47 years and he's always been good to me and he will continue to the rest of my life well, good morning, Tabernacle Church of Metairie. I pray everyone is doing well in our crisis time. I want to let you know we're doing our best to continue ministering to our church as best as we can. I want to thank everyone for tuning in Wednesday night for our discipleship teaching. We had a good time. People were, were on and listening. And also to our Sunday morning service. Every one of us in the Metairie campus is missing each other. We're missing having fellowship. We're missing seeing each other. But I want to tell you this too will pass. 
And we will be back together again, hopefully soon. But I want to let you know we have secured our church location in Metairie on West Napoleon Avenue. Some work has been done, but it has stopped because of the virus restrictions. But God is still in control. It's going to happen. So we're just going to believe God. Last Sunday's message that I preached was, was titled, We Need a Word. And I've been thinking about that, that we need a rhema word from God, a personal word. We need, we need to hear from God for a personal need. But I also was thinking that we not only need a word from God, but we need a place to be. We need to be where God is. And the psalmist David knew what that meant when he wrote Psalm 27. And I want to begin reading in verse 4. David said, One thing I asked of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling." He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. That was the place that David sought of the Lord. His desire was to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. That's what every Christian's desire ought to be, is to dwell in the house of the Lord throughout his entire lifetime. And that has been, been my experience. But David says to seek him in his temple because he knew that in the day of trouble he will keep him safe in his dwelling. David said this, that he will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle. The word tabernacle was first mentioned in the book of Exodus chapter 25 when the Lord spoke to Moses. He told Moses this, in verse 8, he says, Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. The tabernacle was designed by God and told Moses to build it exactly as he planned it. Don't put your own ideas in it. Don't put your own design but make it exactly like I planned it. The tabernacle in the Old Testament was a tent-like structure that was covering over the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was where God's presence was, and the Shekinah glory of God hovered over it. It was a tent that it was a movable uh, a structure and it traveled wherever the cloud of God would move. When God would move, the tent would move. So the tabernacle was not a permanent location. It's such as our churches in our ministry. We are presently in three locations. And only the Lord knows how many more there will be. There could be more as the years go on. So the tabernacle expressed two facts in the life of the Israelites. Number one, it stood in the center of the camp of Israel, and it represented the presence of God. Now, that's where every believer needs to be. He needs to know that the presence of God is where we are. That's why the place to be is important. The presence of God is where we are. The second thing is that the tabernacle also symbolized the divinely appointed means by which sinful man could approach God. In other words, the sinful man had a place to go to meet God. A God otherwise would be unapproachable. In other words, without the tabernacle, they had no shot of ever even approaching God because God's presence was there. So I titled this message, Living in the Tabernacle. Some time ago, the pastors and elders of this ministry discussed 
in a meeting how we're going to promote this ministry with a name change. The church in Chalmet, where this ministry originated, I pastored it for 15 years before Katrina. It was always referred to as the tabernacle. It started out when I got here 29 years ago. It started out as the Assembly of God tabernacle. Then when our missions emphasis grew, we began supporting 35 missionaries all over the world. We changed the name to World Prayer Tabernacle, which is still our legal name. But we will be doing business as the Tabernacle Church. When we promote the ministry, it will be the Tabernacle Church in each one of the cities, Chalmette, Covington, and Metairie. But David said he sought the place where God was, a place where in times of trouble, he said he will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle. So what is life like in the tabernacle? Well, for sure, it's a supernatural experience. There is a New Testament experience of what David was looking for. It was an experience the Apostle Paul had. It was a supernatural experience. And when I say supernatural, I mean this thing is out of this world. And when I'm thinking about the word supernatural, that Christianity is a supernatural life. It's not a natural life, not a religious life. It's a supernatural life. It's a life that, that God has given us, which is supernatural. The supernatural God and his spirit is now living in us. So Christianity, every day, every minute of our life, is supernatural. But the, the Apostle Paul had a supernatural experience in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. He's telling the Corinthian church about it. He says in verse 1, I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I will not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from being conceited, because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sakes, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships, persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Apostle Paul tells the church about a great revelation experience that he had. He was caught up to the third heaven. So in which he said he called it paradise. The third heaven is where God dwells. This is the place where all the action takes place. This is where God dwells. And this was such a great supernatural experience that Paul had. But Paul said he was not permitted to speak about it. In other words, it was something that was strictly for Paul to experience. He was not to go around talking about it. See, the problem with believers today, and we all want supernatural experiences. We all want to experience something that is so personal and so, so supernatural from God that, that 
such an experience like that would cause the, the ordinary Christian to be puffed up. And I've heard a lot of people that, that had supernatural experiences that they were way up here telling everybody all they saw, all God revealed to them, and that they were so spiritual. Well, that's why I believe God doesn't show us a lot of things. Because if he did, we'd all be puffed up. We'd all be proud. We'd all think that we're something special. Now, Paul said that to keep him from being conceited or prideful, that's why he's saying this was a man I'm talking about, he wasn't even talking about himself, but he said, even if I said that, I'd be telling you the truth, but I'm not going to tell you all that. But he said, to keep from being conceited or prideful, he was given a thorn in his flesh. And he said it was sent by the way of Satan. God allowed Satan to give him a, a thorn in his flesh to keep him from being so proud and puffed up. Now, there are many debates over what this thorn in Paul's flesh was. I heard many uh, pastors get around talking about it. Everybody got their idea what it was. If we needed to know that, God would have put it in there. But what it was is not the main thing. The purpose of the thorn is more important than what it actually was. Paul didn't tell the church what it was, but he told them the purpose of it. And he said this in verse 7. He said, it was given to me to keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. See, great revelations cause us to be prideful. In fact, that's why Jesus said, the greatest among you ought to serve. The greatest among you ought to humble himself. In other words, if you know so much spiritually that you need to humble yourself and serve everyone. But uh, Paul concluded that the thorn had a purpose, and that purpose was the will of God. Paul said he pleaded three times for the Lord to take this thing away. But he didn't. It's like Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed three times for the Father. Can you take this thing away from me? This thing I'm looking at here, is there another way? But Jesus resorted in saying, yet not what I will, but what you will. See, God's will must always prevail in our lives. It seems like in Christianity, believers are always looking for the place of utopia, where everything is okay. Well, we don't have any problems. That's what we keep striving for. We keep striving for that place where we can say, wow, I don't have any problems anymore. Nothing to bother me. Nothing to hinder me. Everything is okay. Well, back in the 80s, there was a false teaching called positive confession that if you had enough faith, that you could almost speak all your problems away. And if you had problems, it was because you had a lack of faith. But I want to tell you something. <laughs> That's not the way it is. God uses those trials. God uses those tribulations. You see, where there is no problems, where everything is good, we don't know God. See, there are reasons why Christians don't want, where, where they don't want problems. They want all the thorns in their life removed. There's reasons for it, and I'm going to give them to you. Because they bother us. They annoy us. They keep us from doing what we want to do. They make us look bad as a Christian. When we have problems, it makes us look bad. When we're going through trials, it makes us look bad. It makes us look like we're weak. It makes us look like we're faithless. It makes us look like we're not living in the favor of God because we're faced with problems. That it attacks our spiritual pride. When we're going through, through hardships in life, we say, what is people going to think of me? I'm a Christian. Why am I going through these hard times? You see, it, it, we think of, well, 
people are going to think that, that I'm backslidden or, or God's punishing me. Well, the exact purpose of the thorns in our life is to keep us from having all of that spiritual pride. You see, this is how the King James Version translates verse 7. It says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there were given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above all measure. But here is the answer that the Lord gave Paul in verse 9. Paul says, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul is writing to the church. He's telling the church that he's okay with the answer. See, Paul didn't complain about the answer. God gave him the answer. He said, I'm okay with that. We should be okay with it too. This is what Paul said. Most gladly, therefore, if this is what the Lord said, then I would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Now, Paul was saying in his weakness, God's power would rest on him. Now, that word rest is very important because the Greek word that is translated rest may be translated as to tabernacle or to pitch a tent over. In other words, when we're in trouble, Paul said Christ will make a tabernacle over us where the presence of God, the power of God, will be a covering over us. And it's likely that Paul knew, drew upon an Old Testament imagery of the glory of God coming upon the tabernacle. If so, he learned that taking delight in his thorn actually would bring blessings upon his life. That the power of God can actually make a tabernacle or a tent over him. He says, God's power will rest over me. In other words, God will put a tent over me. To give him shelter, to give him protection, to give him safety. This is living in a tabernacle. That's why I'm glad that the tabernacle is, is the name of our church. The idea of the power of God covering us like the tabernacle, this speaks of the power of God resting on every suffering believer. If whatever you're going through right now, you have to understand the place that you are. See, we need a place. We don't, need, we don't just need a ram a word from God. I don't want to just hear a word from God. I want to know where I'm at. Where am I? Well, if we understand that we're in the tabernacle where the presence of God is, where the Shekinah glory of God is, what do you have to fear? Paul's revelation of life in the tabernacle was threefold. The first thing, Paul said, in the tabernacle, the Lord's grace is sufficient. What does that mean? His grace means his love, his presence, his favor is sufficient for us. God has enough for us. I don't care what you're going through. His grace is the power to withstand any trial, whether physical, spiritual, emotional, financial, whatever the size or the magnitude of the thorn. Life in a tabernacle is a life of humility. We're going to humble ourselves because we can't get out of this mess. We're going to humble ourselves. We're going to confess our weakness and our dependence upon the Lord himself. That's the place living in the tabernacle. We got to confess that I can't make it. I got to confess that what I'm facing, I'm too weak to overcome. 
See, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. In other words, Paul says, I can do everything, not myself, but in the strength or the power that God gives me, I can get it done. See, we can do it all through him. Why? Because he is the one who gets the glory. In the tabernacle, there's only one glory, and it's his. It's God's. So everything that's taking place in the tabernacle itself brings glory to God. So our life as a Christian should be for his glory. That's why Paul tells us that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is worked within us, look what verse 21 says, To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him be the glory in the church. In other words, God's glory is manifested in the church. How is it? Well, he does miracles. He does healings. He gives provision. He gives his grace. He pours out his love. All of this is in the church. And it's for one reason, that, that our lives would glorify God. That's it. It's the end of the story. God gets glorified in the tabernacle. Now the second part, the first part of that was that, that God's grace is sufficient. The second part of Paul's revelation was that his power is made perfect in our weakness. That's it. For the Lord answered Paul, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, the weaker the believer is, the more power is manifested in them. So I don't care how bad your situation is, or the trouble you're in, or the situation you're in. If it's bad, that means God's got to show up greater. The bigger your problem, the bigger our God's going to show himself. So don't think your problem is greater than God. It's never greater than God. See, but if anyone is proud, self-sufficient, and doesn't depend on God for everything, then they're not living in the tabernacle. If you're on your own, you ain't in there. If you're on your own thinking you can take care of yourself, you think you're big and bad enough, you can, you can handle every situation that comes, then you're not in the tabernacle. The greatest need of a believer is to recognize their weakness before God. That's what Paul said. Paul said, I'm a boast. If that's how God works, if that's what he said, then I'm a boast in my weakness. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a glory in my weakness because in my weakness, he said his strength is made perfect. But just the opposite. When we get puffed up, we think we're so spiritual, we think we're so uh, 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 big and bad, then, then God said, well, go do it. But we can't. So Paul said, I rob the glory in my weakness. When a believer does this, guess what God does? He pours out his strength in your mind and in your heart, and he produces everything that we have need of. The Lord empowers the believer to overcome and conquer. Well, all infirmities, all our weaknesses, then the help, the provision, the sufficiency of God will be evident. It will be evident. I'm living in the tabernacle. This is what happens here. When, I, when I'm weak, then he's strong. When I'm in need, he provides. When I feel alone, he loves me. Whatever the case may be, all of these things are in the tabernacle. This is life in the tabernacle of God. This is what Paul said will rest on him. The tabernacle of God will rest on him. Now, Living in a tabernacle is when this weakness 
turn to strength. It's even proven in the record of the Old Testament faith heroes in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11. We have a record in the New Testament of all the faith heroes of the Old Testament. And this is what the writer says in Hebrews 11.33. He says, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. These faith heroes were living their lives in the tabernacle of God. Their faith in God was the tabernacle that was over them. They experienced their weakness turning into strength. Now, when all sufficiency was afforded to them, it's also afforded to us. There's no difference. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he's done for them, he's going to do for us. Where our weakness can turn into strength. Now the third part of Paul's revelation is this. For Christ's sake. Paul said in verse 10, This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults, hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul was saying, it is for Christ's sake that he was living this way. See, Paul's weakness gave Christ the opportunity to prove himself to Paul. Well, Paul did it. We should do it too. We should realize that in all these various conditions in life, whatever we are facing as a result of this virus thing that has taken over the world, it gives the Lord an opportunity to manifest his power in us. See, this is the greatest witness we as Christians can display before the world. When they see us living in the tabernacle of God. I remember years ago uh, when I was in business and God was blessing me financially tremendously. I had a friend of mine who grew up with me, came and visited me at work. And he says, Carl, what is it? Looks like everything you're touching is turning to gold. I said, you know me. You know where I was. You know how I struggled. I said, but since I came to Christ, Somehow, there is something over me that just keeps blessing me. See, once you're in the tabernacle of God, this is where the blessings are. And this is the greatest witness that Christians can have to the world, is that when God's mercy and all is displayed in their life, even though they're going through trials and tribulations, they always come out victoriously. No matter what we're going through, we overcome, we conquer, we're successful. That is what the world is looking at, and that's where God's glory will be manifested on his people. So this is what David said the Lord would do in verse 5. He said, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling." He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Listen, when we hide ourselves in the shelter of his tabernacle, when we are conscious of our weakness, then we are positioning ourselves for God's power to rest on us or to tabernacle on us. I want to quote from God. I'm going to say what God says to you. In Isaiah 41.10, this is what God says. I'm quoting. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So why don't we do 
what Paul did. Why don't we just boast about our weakness to God so that the Lord's power will tabernacle over us? Let us live up to our church's name. We're in the tabernacle church. Why don't we live up to what the name of our church is? Let us live as people living in the tabernacle of God. I want to pray for us now. I want to pray that we understand this message. I want to pray that we can boast about all that we're going through, that we can boast about all this because we know that God is going to take care of it, that God is going to get us through. I want to pray. Precious Heavenly Father, I pray for the church, not only the Tabernacle Church in Chalmette and Covington and Metairie. I pray for your church worldwide, that your church will realize that our life is living in the tabernacle of God. That when we confess our weaknesses, when we confess that we have need of you, Lord, that you will take care of everything. That your blessings will fall. Whether we need physical healing to those who are fighting the virus, to those who need a spiritual touch, to those who need an emotional, Lord, uh, strengthening. And those that are faced with financial difficulties. I pray, O oh God, that we will recognize where the place we're in. That our place as a believer is in the tabernacle of God. Where his power, his love, his grace, as he told Paul, his grace is sufficient for us. And his power is made perfect in our weakness. And Lord, we thank you for that right now. I pray that faith will rise in your church and in your people. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. God bless your church. I'll see you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. God bless you.